Good afternoon. I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the privilege of serving as director of the Roosevelt House. And on behalf of Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College, I want to welcome you to yet another Roosevelt House public program on Zoom, the platform we've been deploying over the last seven months to stay connected and stay true to our mission of civic engagement, even in an age of such dispiriting social isolation when it could not be more important to stay connected online. Just last week, for example, Roosevelt House events attracted hundreds of attendees from the Hunter community and from far beyond with discussions of journalism's place in preserving democracy and also Eleanor Roosevelt's evolution into an international icon of human rights. This afternoon, true to Eleanor's focus on America's role on the global stage, we pick up on America in the international community, specifically how our nation relates and occasionally doesn't relate to the rest of the world. As people across the globe continue to confront a pandemic that knows no borders, the question of if, how, and when we choose to work together for a common cause could not be more urgent. I don't think the irony of our topic this afternoon can be overlooked at a time when isolation uh, is our only path to survival, some say, we're about to, do, do, to explore diplomatic isolation, which sometimes is a path to irrelevance and danger. We're told uh, to wash our hands as often as possible to survive, but when we wash our hands of our relationships around the world, the danger is also very high. Uh, maybe a metaphorical comparison, but surely there can be no better time for an exploration of our nation's history of both international engagement and international detachment, for better and for worse. To guide us on today's exploration, we have the pleasure of welcoming to Roosevelt House the author, scholar, professor, and former White House foreign policy advisor, Charles Kupchan. As one of the nation's leading experts on the history of American foreign relations, he offers perspective on the strategic policy trends that continue to shape our country's role in the world. And he sees these evolutions both as a practitioner and as a scholar. A particular concern tonight will be the opposing American tendencies toward, on one hand, staying out of the world's business, and on the other hand, collaboration and occasional intervention. Charles Kupchan is a professor of international affairs at Georgetown University and senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations. His scholarship, as I mentioned, is informed not only by years of observation and analysis, but significant firsthand experience at the highest levels of government. In addition to work at the State Department, he also served on the National Security Council of the Obama administration, and before that, on the National Security Council during the Clinton years. As for his books, they both explain the history of our nation's strategic foreign involvement and forecast how the international order may change in the future. His approach combines that of clear-eyed historian and judicious policymaker, bringing to bear his knowledge and experience in identifying problematic policy trends and proposing constructive redirection. Those books include No One's World, How Enemies Become Friends, The Sources of Stable Peace, and The End of the American Era, U.S. Foreign Policy and the Geopolitics of the 21st Century. We're delighted to gather tonight for a discussion of his latest, Isolationism, A History of America's Efforts to Shield Itself from the World. Here, Mr. Kupchan offers the full story of American isolationism from the founding era when George Washington first advised that we steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world to the America first policies of today. The book not only seeks to clarify the past, but illuminate a path forward by identifying a middle ground between overreach and underreach 
between doing too little and doing too much. And we are eager to hear more. Mr. Kupchan's cautionary and insightful work offers the guidance needed, as we like to say here at Hunter, to care for the future. Our special guest will be in conversation this afternoon with Hunter's own Andrew Polsky, the Ruth and Harold Newman Dean of Social Sciences and a professor of political science at both Hunter and the CUNY Graduate Center. Andy is the author of Elusive Victories, the American Presidency at War, and The Rise of the Therapeutic State. Andy was also the editor of the Eisenhower Presidency, Lessons for the 21st Century. His scholarship has been widely published and cited, and he is the former editor of the political science journal, Polity. So welcome to you both. As always, we will have a discussion period of about 40 to 45 minutes, followed by a live moderated question and answer session with you, our audience, um, invited to participate. At any time during the conversation, please use the Q&A function on your computer to send us your queries. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dean Andy Polsky in conversation with author Charles Kupchan. Thank you, Harold. Welcome, Charles. It's good to be able to spend some time with you tonight. Um, I'd like to, to, to begin, if we might, with the story behind the book. What led you to write isolationism at this particular moment? Well, uh, as you were, as you were, um, were suggesting, this isn't something that started with the, with the Trump era. In fact, it, I would say it goes back to the 1990s when I served on the National Security Council and was uh, also all that at that time a, a professor. And I began to sense that something was changing in the American public mind. Uh, the, the coverage of international affairs in the press declined sharply. Uh, after the 1994 midterms, Republicans and Democrats parted company on foreign policy. That bipartisan foundation of internationalism began to erode. President Clinton was very reluctant to get involved in the Balkans, despite the bloodshed that was occurring there. You know, and that's when I began to say, could it be that the, the country might turn inward as it did for much of its, of its history prior to Pearl Harbor? And then we had 9-11 and the kind of isolationist sentiment to come back disappeared. But after the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan didn't go so well, and they turned into what we now call the forever wars, that isolationist sentiment, the desire to pull back, came back. And that's when I said, you know what, I think I'm gonna go back and, uh, and look at the nation's history, better understand this tension between stay out of the world, get into the world. That was all before Donald Trump's election. Then he gets elected, he goes for America First, which is a throwback, as you know, to the America First Committee of the interwar era. And suddenly this debate about isolationism and the American role in the world becomes front and center in our political discourse. Here, um, as we begin to talk about the book, I think it's useful to clarify what you mean by certain terms that you use frequently in the book. Um, three words in particular, I wonder if you could define for us as we go forward. One, isolationism. The second word, unilateralism. And then thirdly, internationalism. Isolationism is a very loaded word. Uh, it became a dirty word on December 7th, 1941, and has essentially been a political epithet, a pejorative ever since. Uh, and I, I, let me just kind of define it as I use it in the book so it kind of loses some of that historical baggage. Some of that baggage is deserved in my mind, some not. But for me, isolationism refers to a strategic doctrine that says that the nation should not extend its strategic reach beyond the mothership, the mothership being North America. Uh, and uh, the US was very engaged in the world commercially from the beginning. Uh, 
uh, but it was unwilling to entangle itself, particularly in great power politics until the end of the 19th century. We, we had many opportunities to get involved in the affairs of others to annex Hawaii, Cuba, Haiti, Puerto Rico. We debated it and we always said no. So for me, isolationism is the doctrine that says, let's just stay home and tend our own garden. The opposite is internationalism, which to me is a willingness to extend strategic commitments abroad. And again, we've always been engaged in the world. We've always been commercially connected. We've always been culturally connected. We've been diplomatically connected. Uh, but I distinguish in the book between whether or not we are willing to take on uh, strategic commitments outside uh, our, our national territory outside of North America. Um, remind me of the third word. The third term, unilateralism. Unilateralism. Unilateralism is, is in some ways the flip side of isolationism because one of the reasons that the, uh, the founders counseled isolationism is because they wanted to have a free hand in the world. They didn't want to be entangled in the affairs of others. And I'll just tell a very quick story, Andy, to show how powerful this sentiment was. We formed an alliance with, 70, with the French in 1778, even though the founders didn't want to. And we did so because we were losing the Revolutionary War. And the French honored that alliance. They came across the Atlantic, ships, troops, guns, and they turned the war around. Were it not for the French, you and I might be speaking today with English accents because we could still be part of the, of the British Empire. Then the war ends, the US starts life as, as a separate nation. And in 1793, Britain and France go to war again. And the French king has George Washington on his speed dial. And he calls George and he says, hey, George, remember that alliance? We took your chestnuts out of the fire. Now you come across and help us against our common enemy, the British. What does George Washington do? He hangs up the cell phone and he issues the proclamation of neutrality in which he basically says to the French, good night and good luck. You are on your own. So we reneged on an alliance. We didn't form another alliance until after World War II. That's a long run, right? 1793 to after World War II. And it wasn't just isolationism that pushed Washington to do that. It was unilateralism. He did not want to tether his wagon to the British, the French, and the war between them. And it was unilateralism that sank the League of Nations, as, you, as I'm sure you know, because you've written about this period, more than it was isolationism. The Republicans who voted down the Versailles Treaty and said no to the League of Nations were internationalists, but they just didn't want the US to compromise its sovereignty by perhaps allowing some kind of international body to tell it what to do. Right, we're, we're gonna have a chance to talk a little more about that period, but I don't wanna jump over the first part of the book, um, the period when the United States willingly, eagerly embraced isolationism, basically up until the end of the 19th century, American foreign policy was driven by isolationist impulses. Why was it that Americans so keenly embraced isolationism for more than the first century of the Republic? Well, I think if there's one concept, one phrase that pulls the different strands of isolationism together, it's the notion of American exceptionalism. And that may sound strange to the audience tonight because most of us have grown up in an America in which American exceptionalism is a justification for going out in the world, for spreading democracy, for meeting threats abroad, in some ways for recrafting the world in the American image. But that's new. That kind of American exceptionalism really started in 1898. And before 1898, American exceptionalism was the justification for staying out of the world. And it, it came in various flavors. There was 
geographic exceptionalism. We've got big oceans and small neighbors, therefore we have natural security. There was unilateralist exceptionalism, which was we are not going to uh, tie ourselves to others because we want complete liberty in the conduct of statecraft. There was what I would call libertarian exceptionalism, the fear that engagement abroad would compromise liberty and prosperity at home. The founders were terrified that if they became more ambitious, built a large army, built a large navy, the US would turn into a tyranny. The federal government would get too big and too strong. And there was also a sense of what I would call racist exceptionalism. And that is that the United States was populated by exceptional people, mainly Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and we didn't want to dilute that uh, exceptional character by incorporating into the body politic non-whites from the Caribbean, from the Pacific, from Latin America. So that was yet another layer. And then finally, there was, there was a pacifist strain of exceptionalism, which basically said the US is blazing a new path in the world. We're not gonna play by the rules of realpolitik like the Europeans that we left behind. We're gonna be an enlightened nation and we're going to conduct statecraft on the basis of enlightenment principles and the rule of law. Uh, so it's a complicated mix, but I think it all comes back to the sense of the US blazing a new path in the world. So for during that period of time, the first century plus, um, although the United States was isolationist, it was never isolated. Um, and Americans were always very much engaged in the world. What were the counter, counter forces pulling the United States towards international engagement during that time? I mean, there, there was a tension between internationalism and isolationism from the get-go. Uh, going back to the Model Treaty of 1776, which was the, a sort of template for how the U.S. would conduct its, its foreign relations. Uh, and they, this was a debate that, that continued in part because of commercial engagement. And I would point out that the United States Navy on numerous occasions did go abroad to go after Barbary pirates, to defend traders in Latin America, to defend traders in the Pacific, but they were short uh, interventions to essentially make sure that American citizens and their economic interests were protected. We didn't want enduring strategic commitments, but we were willing to back up commercial expansion with force. So that was one tension. Another tension was, if we are in fact an exceptional chosen nation, shouldn't we put our force and our power behind our ideological ambition. Uh, so for example, uh, in the 1920s, there was a big debate between Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams about getting more involved in supporting Republican government in Latin America, about getting more involved in supporting Republican government after the revolutions of 1848 in Europe. But in the end of the day, when those debates took place, they always ended up in the same place, which was, no, we're not gonna go down that road. And isolationism basically had a lock on the nation's politics until the 1890s. Well, that's good. You bring us then to, to 18, the 1890s and 1898 in the Spanish-American War, when the United States did in fact embrace internationalism for the first time, why? Well, I think the story starts in the early 1890s when there are some in the American government and in the, the broader civil society that, that say, listen, we've arrived. Isolation worked. We're a great power. And it's, it's hard to, to overstate what happened to the American economy after the Civil War. It expanded by leaps and bounds so that by the end of the 19th century, the United States is one of the world's leading producers of iron, steel, and manufactured goods. We're a great power. And eventually people say, well, if we're a great economic power, we should also be a great military power. And the first big debate over this is in 1890, when 
the Navy says to Congress, we need battleships. Uh, because up until that point, the United States only had smaller ships to protect commerce and to protect the coasts. And so Congress went berserk when the Navy said, we need battleships. And many senators and House members said, for what? What are we going to do with battleships? And in fact, they hid the, the ball and they called them coastline battleships to pretend that they were only to protect the American coast where actually Alfred Thayer Mahan and others wanted a blue water Navy. So they basically kind of hit the ball so that they could get this through Congress, which they did. And then the other turning point was 1898 when the US put those battleships to use. And there I think one, one sees that the change in the American narrative of exceptionalism because of the closing of the frontier, because fear that the US had completed manifest destiny abroad, uh, the dominant narrative was, okay, we've completed the mission here at home, now it's time to take it overseas. And that's how McKinley justified the Spanish-American War. But it led to the effective colonial occupation of Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, the Philippines, Samoa, the Wake Islands, and Midway. And so Americans were told, we're an exceptional nation, we're going out to free the world from empire and colonialism, and suddenly we've become an empire. And that really sets the stage for the backlash against internationalism that occurs after 1898. And, and what, what turned Americans against the, these colonial outposts the war had been, by all appearances, a quick success at relatively low cost. America had entered the world stage, had something to boast about, um, but it didn't work out that way. Americans did, in fact, turn against it. Why? Well, you know, it's interesting, Andy. The U.S. won the Spanish-American War, and it won World War I, but it was unhappy with both. Victory didn't lead to an enduring internationalism. And I think in the case of the Spanish-American War, it was just too realist. It was too uh, bald assertion of geopolitical ambition. Particularly, the Philippines were, became a problem because an insurgency broke out in 1898, 1899, and it led to the death of 4,000 Americans, hundreds of thousands of, of Filipinos, not unlike the Iraq insurgency, that came after the invasion in 2003. And Americans said, what are we doing? Why are we fighting these overseas wars? It doesn't do us any good and we've turned into an empire. And then Wilson overcorrects. He tries to sell internationalism on idealist grounds and guide the United States into the League of Nations to save the world for democracy. But Americans are dying in the trenches they don't know that they want to be tethered to some League of Nations council. And so again, you get this backlash against internationalism that sets the stage for the darkest era of isolationism, which is during the 1930s. Let's stay with Wilson for a moment and unpack his internationalism because it's different from the internationalism of William McKinley. As you point out, um, McKinley is an expansionist, he's a realist, he's an imperialist of sort of the classical sort. Wilson is a different kind of internationalist. He's not selling this as something that's um, essentially strictly in America's interest. He has a vision of internationalism that sets it apart. Tell us a little bit about his vision of internationalism. Well, Wilson was in, was in some ways the father of what we now call liberal internationalism, which is a, a rules-based international system supported largely by the world's democracies with the United States at the lead. But it's important to keep in mind that he began as an isolationist. He was in some respects uh, an imperialist because he was very assertive in the Western hemisphere, but only in the Western hemisphere. And then when World War I breaks out, he goes back 
and reclaims all of the 19th century arguments about why the US should stay out. This is Europeans being Europeans. The US has to remain a repository of light, enlightenment, of reason, of rule of law. We will mediate, but we won't get involved. We don't want to compromise our sovereignty by being an ally. And I would point out that even after he entered the war, he, he did so only as an associated power, not an allied power, to maintain the American room for maneuver. But what, what happened then when he began to, to, to pivot toward engaging in the war is he continued this vision of the United States as a, as a pathblazer, as an idealist country that has no national interest. We, we harbor no ill will. We're doing this because of human rights and a good cause. And this is the case that he took to the American people. But it didn't jive with the fact that Americans were dying in the trenches. And so there's a backlash against World War I. He then comes uh, to the end of the war. He goes to Europe. He spends most of 1919, the first half of the year, in Europe selling the League of Nations to the Europeans, negotiating the treaty, comes home, tries to get it ratified three times, always fails, and then finally says, you know what? The Senate is the problem. It's those darn Republicans. I'm gonna make my case to the American people. And he says the 1920 presidential election is a referendum on idealism and internationalism. And the Republican candidate, Senator Harding, basically says, make my day. I stand for the policies of George Washington. I am against entangling alliances. And what happens? Harding wins in one of the most lopsided elections in American history. And it's really the end of Wilsonian idealism until World War II. That's an interesting moment then to, take, to look at because the way you've explained it leaves open at least two different possibilities here for what might have happened. The question I would raise is, was actual ongoing international engagement as Wilson imagined it, ever a realistic possibility? Did he blow it by the way he approached it? Or was it something that was simply too much for Americans to accept? I, I think that he, that Wilson overreached that he was heading in the right direction, but he overreached politically and ideologically by pushing too far. Because as I mentioned, the Republicans in 1919 and 1920 were not hardcore isolationists. There was an isolationist wing that was called the Irreconcilables that was led by Senator Bora, but the mainstream wing led by Senator Vandenberg was internationalist, but it was unilateralist in the sense that they weren't willing to ratify the Versailles Treaty and put the United States into an international body that they thought could compromise the right of Congress and the president to make decisions about war and peace. Vandenberg said to Wilson, I'm willing to compromise. Here are a set of revisions to the treaty which if you are willing to accept, we can get behind the League of Nations. And Wilson basically said, no, uh, this is a matter of principle. This is a moral issue. The, the League of Nations will lose its moral authority if I revise the treaty. Uh, and so he dug his feet in and he, he went down in flames uh, because of that. Uh, and it, it, I wouldn't want to say that that idealism and internationalism were gone because the U.S. did go for arms control in the 1920s. Right. It did go for um, a treaty outlawing war. So there were some buyer's remorse about the end of World War I, but there really wasn't a readiness to take on strategic commitments in the European or Asian theaters because that's what they did during World War I and Americans didn't like it. We then come to um, the Great Depression um, and the rise of dictatorships, fascism, um, and that's the time when isolationism earns its bad name. 
um, in the period right before World War II. Why were Americans so committed to isolationism, especially when the threat of aggressive expansionism from Germany and Japan was increasing and was evident. 1937, Japan basically launches war across China. Um, Germany begins its, ag its aggression, gobbling up neighboring states before, and then finally entering World War II. 1939, Americans are still deeply isolationist and continue fundamentally in that path right up till Pearl Harbor. Why was isolationism so strong in that period? Uh, you know, I think it, it stems from, from several forces, many of them with ties back to the 19th century. One is that Americans made a run in internationalism, both a realist brand and an idealist brand, and they didn't like it. They basically said, hmm, gave that a try, don't much care for this. There was a nativism and nationalism and racism that came out of World War I, uh, a fear of too many immigrants. And you get 1924 legislation that was draconian. It reduced the intake of Jews and Catholics from Southeastern Europe by 90%. It basically excluded all Asians. And then in the 30s, about a million Americans of Mexican heritage are literally deported to Mexico. So there was a real xenophobia during this time. And then once the Great Depression hits, everybody focuses like a laser on the domestic front. The US basically goes its own way on trade, on monetary policy, on geopolitics. And part of the story here is that there was a Nye Commission in Congress that investigated the sources of World War I and why did we go down that rabbit hole? And the conclusion was, because we were dragged into the war by the military industrial complex, arms merchants, banks. And so there was a fear that this could happen again. And that led to a series of neutrality laws, tightening neutrality laws that basically said the United States can do no business with any country at war. And that lasted right up until 1939 when Roosevelt began to worry that if Britain fell to the Nazis, the Nazis would actually come to the Western Hemisphere and after us. And that's when he begins to convince Congress to allow aid to flow across the Atlantic and the Pacific. But you know, he's remembered as a great wartime leader and internationalist, but he was not until the Japanese brought the war to the United States. Even in 40 and 41, when he was battling the America First Committee, it was not to enter the war. He wanted to provide aid to Europe to keep the United States out of the war. So the, the sort of isolationism was extremely strong and public opinion polls from 1941, right, while Europe and Asia are burning, said 80% of the American public wants to keep out of World War II. Yes. And then, though, the United States is drawn into the war. And in the course of the war, Roosevelt is able to build significant support for internationalism where Woodrow Wilson had failed to do so. Um, and Roosevelt's brand of internationalism then survived for decades, really. What were the keys to Roosevelt's ability to build some support for internationalism? Um, and then I'll ask you why it was able to survive for as long as it did? Well, I think that there was a, a kind of flip in the American narrative of exceptionalism that took place <clears throat> with Pearl Harbor. And essentially the Americans said, listen, if we can't protect the American experiment by standing aloof, we're gonna have to protect the American experiment by going abroad and engaging. We need to make the world safe for American democracy because we have the, no choice but to engage in the world when the world is coming at us. And I think Roosevelt drew lessons from the McKinley and Wilson era and his internationalism was a blend of realism. Everything was about the national interest, but also idealism. This was about 
American principles and about American exceptionalism. Unlike Wilson, who turned his back on Republicans, Roosevelt was always mindful of keeping his efforts bipartisan and made sure that Republicans were part of the conversation leading to the formation of the United Nations and other key events. And then third, I think there was a, just a, a kind of very different change socioeconomically, right? The 30s were a period of great hardship. Then you have the New Deal, the wartime boom, and that led to a sweet spot in American politics, a new coming together in the center between moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans that stood behind this Rooseveltian compact between the assertive use of American power, which is where the kind of the Republican tradition was, and international partnership and multilateralism, which is where Wilson took the Democrats. So there was a good um, an ideological tasting menu for left and right. And that really lasted, I think, right through the Obama administration, that kind of centrist compact. It started to erode in the 1990s, but I think it really has come apart during, during the, the Trump era. He has, he has taken us back, as I said, to a, to a world where the differences between Republican and, and Republicans and Democrats, what we call the compact behind liberal internationalism has really come to an end. So I see the, the shift from Obama to Trump as being a historical breakpoint that started in 1941 and ran until 2016. But internationalism began to unravel or recede basically at the end of the Cold War. Um, the consensus began to come apart. So is it fair to say that American internationalism is really a kind of historical anomaly that owes to the combination of post-war prosperity and the fact that there was a durable ideological enemy in the Soviet Union? Well, you know, I think that you are right to say that this story of, of the unraveling of internationalism does begin in the 90s. It then picks up speed, particularly after the wars in the Middle East. And one of the things that I worry about today is that because of the pandemic, because of polarization, because of fear that expansion abroad, internationalism has come at the expense of the liberty and prosperity of Americans, because of the growing nativism, there is a risk that we go back to a dangerous isolationism like we did during the 1930s. And so one of the punchlines of my book is, it's now time to find that middle ground. It's, it's time to find the stable balance between doing too little, which is what we did for most of our history, and doing too much, which is what we've been doing more recently, to a brand of internationalism that does enough. And that will require a trimming in my mind of foreign commitments of bringing our, our purposes and our means back into a, alignment with our foreign policy. Because right now, I think the US is in a position in which it is, it is overextended, in which our foreign policy does not enjoy the support of the American public, either Democrats or Republicans. I, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump, but I think we have to harvest lessons from his presidency and pursue a foreign policy moving forward that finds a new political sweet spot between overreach and underreach. One of the distinguishing features of American politics in our own era is the very sharp degree of partisan polarization that exists, and that includes foreign policy. I wonder if un in, under these circumstances, when parties not only are they polarized, but they seem to polarize more issues all the time, whether the political conditions are there for any kind of agreement on a new foreign policy that both parties would be willing to support. You know, it's a, it's a $6 million question, Andy. I think um, Joe Biden, were he to be the next president, is probably as well poised as anyone to try to rebuild that bipartisan center because he is someone who has tended to work across the aisle across his career, 
and he's an internationalist, but he's, he's a pragmatic internationalist. Uh, whoever the next president is, uh, this is gonna be a tall order because the country is polarized. And it seems to have started at elite levels, right? The, the, the polarization was very pronounced in Capitol Hill for, for the better part of the last two decades. But now public opinion polls are showing that the same polarization is occurring among the, uh, the American public, largely along partisan lines. I do think that there is a new sweet spot to be had. I do think that those counseling that the United States should come home, come home America, and those who believe in restoration, that we can go back to we were where we were before the Trump era, they have to meet in the middle. And that means reassessing our priorities, reallocating our resources. I think our foreign policy has become way too over-militarized. We need to focus on emerging issues like cyber threats, climate change, global pandemics, which we're living through right now. And I, I'm someone who sort of shares the view of, of George Kennan, the father of containment, who says, let's keep our eye on the big areas of military industrial power in the world. So that says to me, we ought to be trimming our commitments in the Middle East and other areas that are called the strategic periphery but staying put in Europe and staying put in East Asia because the same dictum that led us into World War II applies today. And that is we need to prevent the domination of Eurasia by a hostile power. And at least for now, Russia and China appear to be countries that uh, um, do pose a threat to their neighbors and ultimately to the United States. What would you do then about a country like Iran, it's in a region of the world that you're saying is not as central to us, um, but it's a dangerous player in a very volatile part of the world. And one of the things we've seen in volatile parts of the world, like the Middle East, is spillovers. The problems don't get contained in the region, um, if only because of a refugee crisis. Is, there, is it realistic to speak about a strategic retrenchment that sees us, in a sense, walk away from military commitments and alliances in parts of the world that are outside of those main industrialized areas? Well, I think our main strategic mistake of the last couple of decades is getting involved in land wars of choice in the Middle East that have not gone well. In particular, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Libya. And in my view, we can preserve our interests in the region by having a much smaller footprint, by keeping our forces offshore, maybe have a small contingent in Afghanistan to fill the counterterrorism uh, role. With Iran, uh, the last thing I would do with Iran is start a land war. If in the end of the day, force is required to deny Iran a nuclear capability, that can be handled from offshore platforms, from standoff platforms. And so I do think that, uh, that we need to continue to have a strategic hand in that part of the world, keep open the Straits of Hormuz. But a lot of that can be done without the in interventions, intrusions, long wars that we have engaged in. I mean, to put it, to put it simply, trying to turn Afghanistan and Iraq into Ohio has been a fool's errand. Donald Trump speaks of America first. Um, maybe I'll make this the last question before we open it up. Um, but his America first isn't the America first of the isolationists of the 1930s, although he uses the phrase. How would you characterize his view of the world and foreign policy in terms, in historical terms, where do we fit him? Um, does he have any, are there any parallels, counterparts in the past to the Donald Trump view of the world? Well, you know, as, as I think we, we may have discussed at the very beginning, America first, a la Trump, is a bolt from the blue for 
contemporary Americans like ourselves because we've been living in the era of Pax Americana. In America, exceptionalism, meaning let's go out and run the world. But the isolationism, the unilateralism, the nativism, the protectionism that is part of America first really does have antecedents. Uh, and I don't think that Trump reads a lot of American history. Uh, and so I don't think he's coming to that through his knowledge of the nation's past, but he is tapping into a part of the American DNA, American political culture, what I would call the American experience. Uh, and you know, he, he has talents. He is a talented politician in many respects. As a performer, as a reality TV star, but nonetheless, he has political talent. He has a good sniffer, to put it euphemistically. Um, my problem with Trump is that he is, he's asking good questions. He is aware of the fact that many Americans feel the country has overreached and that it's time to focus on nation building here at home, as Obama used to like to say. But his foreign policy overall is incoherent. When he withdraws from Syria or Afghanistan or draws down from Germany, it may be the right thing to do in the big scheme of things, but it is done at night via tweet. It's not wedded to a diplomatic strategy. It's not wedded to some sort of coherent view of where the United States should be headed. So in my mind, Trump's America First is a perfect example of how retrenchment should not take place, even though in broad terms, I think he's asking questions that need to be asked and we have to harvest lessons. It is time, as Trump has made clear, for the United States to embrace a brand of foreign policy that enjoys broader support among the American public. Thanks, that's a great place to pause in our conversation and open up for some questions from the audience, which Mac's going to forward uh, relay to us. Yes, hello. Thanks to you both for this discussion. It's been excellent. Um, so I do have some questions from the audience that I'll share with you now. First, uh, Keith Danish posits that one can favor a foreign policy of realism and restraint without being an isolationist. Why use a loaded term like isolationism? I, I am in the kind of camp of restraint, judicious retrenchment, I am opposed to those who are arguing for an American retreat from the world. I think that that would be a big mistake. But one of the reasons I chose to use the word isolationism is in part because it, I think it has gotten um, a bad rap when it deserves to be part of a broader national conversation. It did become a dirty word deservedly in the 1930s but I do think it's important to realize that during the 19th century, a strategy of strategic detachment served the country well. It is an important part of America's rise. The United States advanced its interests by staying out of the affairs of others and encouraging them to stay out of our affairs. There is, there is an enduring strategic wisdom to isolationism that I think needs to be reclaimed. Uh, and so I, I just, I've, I've wanted to kind of get away from this bimodal debate where either you're a liberal internationalist and America has to run the world, or you're a big bad Luddite isolationist. And to say, listen, let's have a reasoned discourse about how to right size American foreign policy. And that will require learning lessons, good and bad, from isolationism and lessons, good and bad, from the era of internationalism. Stephen Schlesinger asks, given this tradition of isolationism, why do you think the US agreed to join the United Nations? Uh, Stephen, I, th I think it had a lot to do with the, the kind of shock of Pearl Harbor, the shock of, of uh, World War II, and the degree to which some of the factors that Andy and I were discussing 10 minutes ago were at play. The growth of the American economy, 
the degree to which internationalism and international engagement work to the benefit of Americans broadly shared on both sides of the aisle, the degree to which Roosevelt reached out to Republicans and built a bipartisan compact, really for the first time since McKinley, because it was the big debates between McKinley and uh, Williams Jennings Bryan that the Democrats and the Republicans sort of parted company. Before that, they agreed on isolationism. Then they go their separate ways, but Roosevelt brings them back together. And it wasn't just, um, you know, edging over the finish line, it was a slam dunk. Because I would remind everyone that even though the United States voted down the League of Nations three times, the vote in favor of the United Nations was resounding. If I recall correctly, there were only two or three negative votes. So that just gives you some sense as, as to how much the political landscape in the United States had changed. I will just add one further note on this, which I think timing matters a great deal. Roosevelt did not wait until the war was over before he began to put in place the structure for the United Nations. Because one of the things I've argued is, is that once a war ends, a president's influence over post-war policy rapidly declines. That's what happened. That's what part of what undid Wilson. And I think Roosevelt recognized that he needed to move on this while the war was still being fought. And just to pick up on that point, Andy, if you fast forward a few years to 45, 46, 47, you in fact do see the isolationist impulse coming back. There were fierce debates in 49, 50, 51, something called the Bricker Amendment, which would have tied the hands of of the executive branch on making foreign commitments. So for a, a while there, there really was a sense that the US was gonna pull back, but then you get the Soviet Union, you get the Cold War, and that kind of pushes the isolationists to the margins of American politics. Really, I would say 53, 54 was their last gasp. CH, uh, as a, uh mentioning your uh is mentioning is bringing up that you mentioned clinton and his administration uh toward the beginning of this talk and clinton's role in isolationism what was it that caused the isolationism of the clinton administration and do you see clinton as an isolationist no i i don't see clinton as an isolationist but to just to quickly fill in the blank of how i interpret what happened after the fall of the berlin wall as Andy and I were discussing, you know, Roosevelt creates this amalgam between the power preference of Republicans and the partnership preference of Democrats. And that sort of hangs tight until the Berlin Wall comes down. What happens after that is the Democrats become the party of partnership and they like multilateralism. And the Republicans become the party of power and they like force and unilateralism. And the parties go in their separate directions. So the story that I tell of the Clinton era is that he was very internationalist when it came to the enlargement of NATO, when it came to bringing China into the WTO, when it came to creating new multilateral institutions. He wanted to join the Kyoto Protocol and the International Criminal Court. He just couldn't get it through Congress. Uh, so I see him as an internationalist on that one dimension of multilateralism. Then he goes away, the Republicans come in, and they max out on the power dimension and say goodbye to multilateralism. And really since then, we've seen this oscillation in American grand strategy as power changes hands between Democrats and Republicans. Because the, the Democrats generally like multilateralism and being a team player, they don't like going to war. The Republicans, at least until Trump, were more comfortable going to war, but they didn't want to tether the United States to international agreements. It's interesting that you say that because I, I recall that under Bush 43, there was a, an effort, I'm not sure how serious it was, an effort to create a large coalition to support the invasion of Iraq. Of Iraq. Um, there was, it, it turned out in the event that they were not able to get a significant coalition, but it, do we take it 
do we take seriously their efforts at coalition building then to kind of replicate what Bush 41 had done in the, Ku in, in the case of Kuwait? Well, I think, you know, George H.W. was really the last Republican, what you might call a Rockefeller Republican, who hailed from that tradition of pragmatic centrist internationalism. His son was not really in that camp. Uh, and he said no thank you to NATO's offer to go into Afghanistan. The British were by his side in Iraq, but most of the rest of Europe was opposed to the war. The French, the Germans, the Russians, they were all saying, you're crazy to invade Iraq. So the US was kind of on its own. And then what happens is that trouble breaks out. We're up to our eyeballs in trouble in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And that's when George W. Bush kind of rediscovers multilateralism. And he goes out and he does build a broad coalition to help in both countries. But that's in some ways by default, not by design. Here's two questions that I think go together. Cassandra Gonzalez asks, wouldn't getting out of international affairs negatively affect economies that have adjusted to us being there or being involved there, such as Puerto Rico? And then uh, I think the flip side of that question from Diane Kirshner, what are our obligations to the international community as a nation that has used other countries to serve our own enrichment? Well, I, just, I wanna be clear, I'm not arguing for a widespread all dimension retreat from the, for the United States. On the contrary, I think American leadership is more important today than ever. I think we're at a point in which the future of liberal democracy is in question. The United States has on balance tilted the arc of history in the right direction. If we don't play that role, nobody else is going to do it. I think we need to be multilateral. I think we should rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement, get a new diplomatic deal with Iran, go back to being a team player. You can't go it alone in a world that is, de is, 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 is as interdependent as our world. What I'm really arguing for is a trimming of the sails militarily, a right-sizing of our strategic role abroad, because I fear that if we don't do that, if we don't bring our foreign policy back into line with our public will, then we really do risk a retreat. And so this is in some ways an effort to get ahead of isolationism and build a more discriminating, a more selective brand of engagement abroad that is sustainable and that can withstand the test of time. Can I follow up with a question on this? I'm what, what, I, what I'm hearing you say sounds a, a lot like Democratic Party foreign policy talking points um, from the Obama-Biden era. And if I'm listening and I'm a Republican um, and I'm sympathetic to Trump, I'm wondering what's in it for my, my side? I hear your side, I hear your position, but why should I, a, a skeptical Republican unilateralist, go along with that? Well, I think that Republicans and Democrats will come at these issues from different sides, but there is, in my mind, a way to square the circle and to build important coalitions. For example, I would point out that George Soros, who's on the left, and Charles Koch, who's a libertarian on the right, recently came together to fund a new think tank called the Quincy Institute, going back to John Quincy Adams. And their purpose is to try to scale back America's footprint abroad. Soros, more because he has a progressive agenda and he wants to focus on the home front. Koch, because he's a libertarian and he doesn't want the United States to be entangled abroad, but they're teaming up. And I can see the progressive wing of the Democratic Party which is as strong today as really it's been in decades, teaming up with those on the nationalist right of the Republican Party to call for, for this kind of retrenchment. I think you can find Republicans that are concerned about climate change, 
teaming up with Democrats that are concerned about climate change. So I think you would have to cobble together coalitions. But I do think that uh, if, if a president were to articulate a more modest foreign policy, but that still made sense to the American people, people would, would, would rally around it. They would gather around it. And I, I, would, I would point out that many Americans still have a very vested interest in international trade whether because they export goods or because they have their 401ks invested abroad. NATO and alliances in general still enjoy strong popular support. So in my mind, the key here is finding that equilibrium. And if we find it, I'm pretty confident that most reasonable Americans can rally behind it. We've got time for one more, if that's all right with you too. So uh, here's a question that relates these ideas to the COVID-19 pandemic. Peter Goodman asks, well, first he states, we're building fences. The EU nations are building fences. States are building fences. COVID is requiring international fences. Will the post-COVID world erode fences or will they become the norm? Well, clearly right now, COVID is fueling an inward turn partly because our borders are closed with Canada and Mexico and most Americans wouldn't get on an international flight. And even if they got on the flight, they'd be turned back at their destination because the rate of infection here is, is too high for many, for many countries. There is also, I think, a growing concern about the need to focus on the home front. People are hurting. Small businesses are closing. Unemployment has skyrocketed. Wages have been stagnant from well before the pandemic. This is really gonna soak up the attention of the next president uh, irretrievably. Uh, getting, the con getting control over the pandemic, I think will be Biden's first, second, third, and fourth priorities. Because if he wins, obviously, because if you don't get control over the pandemic, the country doesn't reopen and the world doesn't reopen. So at least in the near term, I would say that, that COVID reinforces the internationalist, or excuse me, the isolationist inward turn. Once the pandemic is behind us, that's when I think that it behooves the president, members of Congress, other leaders, not to go back to where we were, not to believe in restoration, but to come forward with a new proactive vision of the country's role in the post-pandemic world to make the case to Americans that we need to stay engaged in the world because it's in our interests, but we need to do so in a selective and discriminating way because I think Democrats and Republicans today agree. We've overreached. We've tried to do too much. We need to uh, husband our resources, we need to trim our commitments to find that new equilibrium between doing too much and doing too little. And that equilibrium has in many respects eluded the United States for much of its history. Hopefully it's time to find it. Charles, thank you very much. We've and covered a lot of ground to this evening, and I appreciate, we all appreciate your joining us for this conversation. Well, my thanks go to you and to Roosevelt House and to, to Hunter, Hunter College for, for sponsoring this and hosting me. It's, it's an important conversation. This is perhaps one of the most important political moments that our nation has ever lived through. Stakes are very high. Uh, I hope we get it right. Now, let me close by giving your book an extra plug because I think it was, it's well worth reading uh, for any informed citizen. Um, and so I would, in, I would encourage those of you out there who are the reading public uh, to, take, to pick up a copy and dig into it. Thank you both. Thank you to everyone who joined tonight. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.